welcome especially all of our new trainees to this. I want to pay a special tribute to Al Margulies of the committee that has put this Grand Round series together for us. It's really an exciting series of presentations, and I, I think that we're off to a wonderful start today, but it's going to continue through the year. It's, it's a special pleasure for me to be able to introduce to you Les Havens. Obviously, he's been here since 1982 and really needs no introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. Les Any department of psychiatry in the country would be proud to have him as a member of the faculty, and it would be an honor for any chairman to be able to introduce him as a member of the faculty. That's especially true for me, because it's a chance to say publicly how much he's meant not just to me in my career, but to a whole generation of students at, med at the medical school here, residents and other trainees in mental health fields at the major Harvard teaching hospital. One thing about Les is he likes to be creative, so I'm going to do something a little bit unconventional with this introduction. I'm going to save most of it till the end after he's finished speaking, before we have our question period. But I do want to say just a three things for you to remember as he begins his talk. The first thing that I hope all of you, especially those of you who haven't met with him much so far, all of you will remember is that he's a true scholar, a tremendous accomplishment. He graduated from Williams College, magna cum laude, and a member of Phi Beta Kappa. He went to Cornell for his medical degree, graduated as a member of Alpha Omega Alpha, which is the Medical Honor Society, studied internal medicine for two years at New York Hospital, and then came to do his residency in psychiatry at what was then called Boston Psychopathic Hospital, now called Massachusetts Mental Health Center. One of the amazing things is that he, he published his first paper while he was a resident in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was on recurrent psychosis associated with liver disease and elevated blood ammonia. Just one year after he finished his training, he won the A.E. Bennett Award, one of the most prestigious awards in biological psychiatry, from the Society of Biological Psychiatry. Just 13 years after he finished his training, he was promoted to the rank of full professor at the medical school, one of the fastest promotion tracks on record. I think that his record of, of accomplishment throughout that time was extraordinary. Some of you may know that he founded the Psychopharmacology Unit at Mass Mental, which is one of the first in the nation and really became very famous for its work. He also did pioneering studies on ECT, and his, his work continues to be something that's quoted about the use of unmodified and modified ECT. One of the things that I've often thought is an observation he made about Carl Gospers in his, his book, Approaches to the Mind, reminds me actually of Les. He said that Gospers could write about such important topics because he was enough of a scholar that he knew everything that had already been written, so he knew what was missing. And that's really the way Les has been. A second point that's worth men mentioning is his creativity, but creativity, I think, combined with courage. Remember that I said it, it was in 1958 when he won the award from the Society of Biological Psychiatry. I didn't even think the field existed back in 1958. But he had gone into it and did those studies at a time when academic psychiatry was focused exclusively on psychoanalysis. Just as he had started that, he also began in the 1960s as a consultant, became the chief psychiatric consultant to the Massachusetts Rehabilitation Commission. At a time when most people in rehabilitation thought the last thing they wanted to see was a psychiatrist or psychiatric patient. They felt that our patients couldn't be rehabilitated. A third point about him is that he has been someone who inspires all of us, not only as a role model, as a dedicated clinician, but by his generosity. Obviously, he's a gifted teacher, but one of the key points about that is how generous he's been with his time and his attention. In 1964 until 1982, he directed the medical student clerkship at Mass Mental Health Center, where he influenced many of us even to go into psychiatry. In 1987, he became the director of the psychiatry residency program here and continued in that until 1996. 
And throughout all of that time, he's won numerous teaching awards. He won the Elvin Simrad Award for teaching for Mass Mental, the Medical Students Teaching Award at the Medical School, the Valentina Donahue Turner Award from the Medical School for Teaching, and the Benjamin Rush Award from the American Psychiatric Association. But what comes through in all of this is his, his dedication, his, his gift to us of his time and his encouragement and his attention to what all of us were trying to do as we were trying to learn psychiatry. And to me, one of the things, again, that reminds me of Les is something that Carl Jaspers did in his textbook on general psychopathology. He emphasized how easy it is for clinicians to explain behavior, something we all learn to do. We do it almost glibly. But how much harder it is for a clinician to be able to understand the patient's experience. And one of the things that Les has done in all of our lives, and I think the same thing that Elvin Simrad could do, is to make us feel understood. He's been able to know how hard it has been to learn how to do this work, and has been able to help us with that and get us through it and keep us inspired to keep doing it. Obviously, his writing, everyone knows on psychotherapy and the frameworks and models of psychotherapy has illuminated our field. His work on language and psychotherapy has taught us the techniques and the goals of the work. And it's really a special pleasure for me then to give you the first half of this introduction and to introduce to you Les Havens for this. Thank you, Jay, more than I could say. I, I'm, I'm very embarrassed, and uh, I hope I can collect my, <coughs> collect my wits enough to launch into this thing I wanted to do. I, um, this is the first of four, or uh, three or four, uh, these rounds I'm going to give. And in, a sen in a sense, are we all right? Uh, in a sense, it's an uh, introduction. Um, it consists of three parts. Uh, one is a historical review of the 50 years that I've been in the field as since mid-century to this time. A second is a discussion of the intellectual framework of those developments. And a third is a set of predictions, which I thought might, might amuse you. Is, this thing talks back to me. <laughs> What? <laughs> what? <laughs> Shanna, <how> wonderful. <laughs> Is it all right? Am I am I doing well? All right. The um. I I'll tell some stories, and and some of you have heard me talk or in our conversations together will recognize these stories. I'm sure. Uh, as you perhaps already diagnosed me, I have entered what my mother called an anecdotage. <laughs> A term, a, term, a term she used about her own father in his the latter years. <coughs> so I hope these stories, if you're all familiar with them, you will, you will listen with indulgence. At mid-century, mid-20th century, psychiatry was still a, a rural pursuit. It was in the, in the state hospitals, in the private hospitals, all had been removed from the cities, even the suburbs. Psychiatry was not to be seen, essentially. And those hospitals were plagued by a central problem, which will only those of you who work in emergency rooms will still have any real sense of, the problem of violence violence. Now in those 50 years, psychiatry has moved from that rural, sequestered, isolated state, dominated by the fear of violence, into general hospitals like this one, into the community. Uh, it's become part of the culture of, of American life. You can't, walk, you can't sit on a subway or in a bus and not hear people talking about projection and denial. And, and now in the last 10, 15 years, we've become, as you know, the Prozac nation. So that our impact 
on individuals and culture is, is today, is today enormous. A hundred years before 1950, the situation was, uh, was even more remarkable. Probably the greatest woman in psychiatry, perhaps the greatest woman in America, with the exception possibly of Emily Dickinson, Dorothea Dix, was walking one day in, in Fall River and looked down at the ground and saw a grating over the earth and saw beneath the grating a human being, a mental patient. That's the way mental patients were kept. And she resolved and in her indomitable way, she, she realized a resolution to create hospitals for the mentally ill. And she did that. Those hospitals wouldn't have gone bankrupt as they have if she'd had a, her way. Some of you know that she got a bill from Congress to give 50 million acres of land grant, land to the state hospitals. And Franklin Pierce, another one of our brilliant chief executives, <laughs> Uh, vetoed it, so they, they started out with all the strikes against them. Today, we, we still have mental patients beneath, beside grates, don't we? We've, we've returned to, to using prisons as places for many of our patients. So the situation, although immeasurably better, has not changed in some very fundamental respects. I'm still too nervous to be enjoying this, and I've got to find some way to relax. <coughs> Maybe I should just try to ignore you all and <laughs> forget about you. <coughs> As I said, the, the mental health work at the time I began it, was dominated by the fear of violence. I went to medical school at Cornell, as Jay has said, and, um, and occasionally I'd go down to Saturday night to Bellevue Hospital, to the emergency room, and watch what they did when they had difficult problems. I was in New York Hospital, which is removed from all the realities of life, and so we never saw anything of this kind. But at Bellevue, you could see what the what was actually going on. And if what, if what in those days was called a paranoid psychopath had broken up several bars on Broadway, they were brought in to the emergency room. They'd be brought in by four or five policemen. And they'd be, um, they'd be handed over to four or five attendants. Not like our attendants today. Our attendants today read Dostoevsky. <laughs> And, and are concerned about mental health. These were all ex-bouncers, ex-policemen. And they took the patients, and they, sla and they slammed them on the ground, and immediately administered electric shock treatment. And um, then they'd wait three or four hours when the person came around a little bit and give them another one. It was literally the only way you could manage violence. And sometimes even that didn't work. At Mass Metal in the 50s, still, mid-50s, we still sometimes would have to get the, the fire department in. They were better than the police department for this, to, to bring their tear gas in, to get patients out from bedding and, and springs that they'd hidden themselves behind and we couldn't reach them. Once we get them out with the tear gas, then we would apply the ECT. Now, for those of you for whom for, he, for whom <coughs> electric shock treatment is a, a kind of an anathema. That there was nothing else to do. There was nothing else to do. No medication would touch them. Can you, can I, can you hear me if I just stand by? Yeah. Yeah. The, um, there was nothing you could do. But in order for them to have the effects that you needed to make life bearable, <coughs> in order to have that, you had to, you had to essentially put them to sleep. And that was often a very dangerous procedure. But ECT, you could manage the patients that way. From the 
time of the introduction to ECT till about 1958, which is a good 30 years, we didn't, we didn't realize that we were fracturing the spines of literally 40 to 60% of the patients who had unmodified ECT. It takes a long time to find out what you're doing to people, whether it's in psychoanalysis or ECT or medications in this business. With the in, the, in the late 50s, the first time medications were discovered which could control this degree of bias. And of course, the one you know best is chlorpromazine or Thorazine. But lithium, which was discovered in Australia, chlorpromazine was discovered in Paris, because lithium was helpful with the bipolar condition. And of course, the so-called schizophrenia is, but any violence was manageable by, um, by chlorpromazine. Now this had an enormous effect because not only did it quiet things down without having to assault the patient so directly, but it also meant that the staff could relax. The staff could relax. The staff was not so afraid. And that doubled or tripled the effects of the civilizing effects of that medication uh, on the patients and the staff. environment came other medications eventually but it came into a psychiatry which was dominated by psychoanalysis now why was psychoanalysis so important in American psychiatry at this, at this time for two reasons one reason was that out of World War II had come an experience with the treatment of neuroses combat neuroses and it was realized that some kind of abreactive process, some kind of supportive abreactive process was often magical in resolving these conditions. And so many of the early leaders of the 50s and the 60s had essentially been principal parties to those discoveries in World War II. Now Hitler was also responsible for another part of this because the disappearance of the psychoanalytic community from Europe was brought about in part by Hitler. And they came, not to all over the world, but they came to America in large numbers. Now this was, a, this was an extraordinary gift to us, although the gift was not always <laughs> meted out to us with that degree of collegiality and joviality we would have hoped, since we'd already saved them in, uh, in Europe. Uh, there was a certain contempt for American culture which came with this, as well as contempt for American medicine, which was part of this psychoanalytic transplantation. <coughs> and of course, we deserved it. We deserved it. Because you, you forget that America only came on the world stage in a cultural sense, you know, <coughs> with people like Jackson Pollock. After that period, we only began to, to compete intellectually, spiritually, artistically later. But nevertheless, they had the contempt. But we paid them back. <laughs> we paid them back. Because we took some of their greatest figures, Heinz Kohlmann, Franz Alexander, who ended up in Chicago. And Chicago did its thing to the psychoanalysts. It made Heinz Kohlmann, who had been quite orthodox, really almost an existentialist, it made Dear old friends Alexander, who had been very orthodox in Berlin, a figure that you might almost call a relational psychoanalyst, which is a much later development. So we paid them back eventually. But both those people were, of course, exiled from the establishment of psychoanalysis at that time. But this was the climate that I came into at that time. And it was exciting. It was an attention to individuals. 
Freud was the reason I'd gone to medical school because he was so interesting to read. So that it was, a, for all its limitations and its orthodoxy, it was an exciting time. And then something else happened, this time not from Chicago, but from St. Louis. In St. Louis, two, two workers, good women, do they, decided that, that psychiatry <coughs> was on the wrong path and that we should go back to the dis discussion of syndromes and sy symptoms and make diagnoses, <coughs> make diagnoses. And this, this movement gathered strength. It gathered strength, I think, principally from the emergence of more and more medication. Because when this movement of diagnosis dominated psychiatry, as it had in the first quarter of this century I'm talking about, then Kreplin, who was responsible more than anything for help for the development of that, his selling point was not that they had a treatment for his conditions, which he would outline, but instead he thought that if you could be specific enough specifically enough about the picture of the condition, it would point to a cause, to etiology. Now that wasn't true. And that idea was more or less destroyed by 1910, 1912. But it persisted, that hope persisted still. But now the hope was that we could find a treatment that is particularly a chemical treatment specific to these different conditions. I leave to your probably better judgment than mine how close we've come to that. But of course, again, chlorpromazine, on the one hand, chlorazine, and lithium pointed in that direction because they seem to be centered on schizophrenia and bipolar. So this was not a foolish notion. And indeed, it may prove to be a much more uh, satisfactory notion than some of us believe at the moment. <coughs> And then something else happened. Something that didn't happen until maybe some of you will know better than I do just when to put it, but the, the change in, in uh, brain, brain knowledge. <coughs> in some ways, this is even more dramatic change in the last, that it took place in the last half century. When I was taught about the brain in medical school, the brain was finished developing by about four or five months of age. It could not reproduce itself, its cells. It lost cells throughout life. It seemed relatively resistant to any kind of cultural or interpersonal connection. It was an extraordinary conception of brain. And so when you ask yourself, how could brain, what? discover Mary Had a Little Lamb, much less the Ninth Symphony, or do some of the things that brain does, that mind does. But notice, notice what it did for us. It created a wonderful puzzle, because if this was the brain, the mind couldn't be in it. <laughs> <laughs> the mind had to be somewhere else. And there came about this extraordinary debates, discussions, and philosophical excursions in an effort to connect the mind with something. What was it? It plainly was unlikely to be brain. Now, however, what have we discovered? In the last 25 years, uh, for example, one of the graduates of the Mass Medal uh, Residency Program won the Nobel Prize for showing the effect on experience, the effect of experience on cells, Eric Kandel. But the evidence of that is, has been present in a number of directions. Two professors at Harvard, George Weasel, won the Nobel Prize also for showing the effect of experience on the occipital cortex, which is enormous. So suddenly, not suddenly, but gradually and with great resistance from the establishment, the social construction, the environmental <coughs> construction of the human brain was demonstrated. Demonstrated. And now you know, as you sure all do know that the brain goes on changing throughout life, develops new cells, has all kinds of problems, the only the beginnings of which we've got to understand. So now we have a brain which resembles our mind. <laughs> our mind. And uh, I'm going to close with some remarks about what that suggests about our work. But I just want to emphasize it for a moment. 
that suddenly we are not alien creatures, right, for whom the body is a, a mystery, an enemy even of our thinking, but suddenly we are in the biological world that's like, not only like, but probably identical with our Those changes are, are momentous over a 45, 50 year period. And um, they give us a psychiatry, which as I said, is now part of the culture, which is uh, as a practice is still somewhat isolated, but which is undoubtedly, undoubtedly uh, something that the future belongs to. And I want to give a little intellectual structure to this. Not, it's not too much of a caricature to say that the first quarter of the, this last century, the 20th century, was dominated, as I said, by a Kreplenian biological descriptive psychiatry. <coughs> the second quarter was not. In fact, it was the only quarter in the, in the whole century in which there was a serious effort to pluralize psychiatry, to think of all kinds of ways of treating patients, all kinds of ways of thinking about patients. For the first time, that gained momentum, thanks to the to the Jaspers from Europe, and then thanks to Adolf Meyer from uh, Hopkins. Now, this was not an incidental development. Don't forget that medical education as a whole had only entered a pluralistic period of its own by about 1910, 1915, 1920. Before that, the diploma school, diploma mill, the allopaths, the homeopaths, the osteopaths, all the different little schools had their own training. But the Hopkins experiment, and to some extent Harvard too, was an effort to bring together what was known and, and teach it as a, as a whole. So that if you, if you wanted to be a chest person, that didn't mean you couldn't also be a foot person. Or if you wanted to be a head person, it didn't mean that there wasn't a place for you to look at someone's, what, you know, anything else, their heart, say. This was an enormous development, and that, I think, is one of the reasons we had this brief interval of a pluralistic psychiatry. Now, as I said to you, that it was overcome by the influx of psychoanalysis into American, American culture. And then again, it was overcome by St. Louis and the whole plan of the psychopharmacology of specific illnesses, which dominated the, still dominates our psychiatry and, and was a major force from about 1970 on. Now, I got interested in pluralism, the school, not only because I had read Jaspers and, and thought it was the most, most extraordinary book I had read in psychiatry, but because it reminded me that there were so many other things I hadn't, didn't know about. And so my own work became an effort to teach myself the rest of psychiatry. And uh, that was exciting. It was also fostered by the psychiatry department I was in, and by, which, by the way, butted off Cambridge from Mass Mental in the 60s. Because there, too, run by, a, run by a, a neurologist, essentially, named Harry Caesar Solomon. <coughs> I, I can never meant to put that name down without asking myself, what, would, what kind of a father is it, or mother, that would name a child Harry Caesar Solomon? <laughs> now, this was not Harry Truman. This was King Henry V. Caesar, no doubt, no doubt not Augustus, but Julius. Solomon himself. But he had a proper Solomonian contempt for all of psychiatry. And as a neurologist, he felt he was on firmer ground. He would be very happy today. When he started out his work, he had his office on Newbury Street, where you couldn't afford to have an office anymore. He had his office on Newbury Street, and he made his living. Can you guess how he made it? This was psychiatry at that time by doing spinal punctures for all the rest of medicine. 
I know Bridge Street anyway. But he liked psychoanalysts. He was amused by them. <laughs> he was basically a, a sort of social psychiatrist. He opened the doors of the, unlocked the doors of men's mental, he cared about the community to some extent. And he had, had an inkling that someone named Elvin Semrad might have been important. And what that inkling was, I don't know. He told me once that the only reason he'd appointed Elvin Semrad, the uh, clinical director of Mass Mental, was that someone had recommended somebody else that he disliked. <laughs> <laughs> now that wasn't true by any means. But I think what he liked about Elvin Semrad was that Elvin Semrad wasn't as strong on the, on the diagnostic side, not as strong on the thinking side, but he had one of the great hearts that, uh, that could be found in our work. So I began to worry about uh, how to put all this together. What were the different parts that need to be put together? What was most important? <coughs> and, I, and I began by noticing that each of the schools does things differently. They sit in a different place. They talk differently. They have different objectives. They're scared of different things. For example, where do they sit? One of Freud's signs of Freud's genius was because he didn't like to be stared at and didn't like to stare at people, he disappeared. Kreplin was a man who looked at his patients because if you could look at the patients, you might decide what they were like. Freud didn't, wasn't interested in, in looking at people and deciding what they were like. So he disappeared and he began to listen, right? The existentialists really wanted to be in the patient's lap. <laughs> or they wanted the patients in their laps. And this got them into all kinds of trouble over the history <laughs> of existential work, I assure you. Some of us wonder whether Marilyn Wright Monroe died because her existential analyst had brought her into his family and perhaps promised more than he could deliver. So when he set his limits, maybe she couldn't stand it. That's just a guess. May have some cancer. One of the great figures in existential work was a man named Minkowski, who decided that in order to understand the person, he should live with them. And he moved into the homes of his patients. And, uh, and you can imagine what that, what that's like. All of you who have been married will know exactly what it's like. <laughs> Sooner there were disputes about when to have breakfast, and what to serve, and why wasn't the toast burnt, all the kinds of inevitable human <coughs> follies that, that make up close contact with each other. He found out something interesting, though. Some of the quarrels were impossible. He was either thrown out or he threw out the patients, but, but sometimes, they resolved the conflicts just because they fought about it. And so there entered psychiatry the concept of a, of a collision, of an, an engagement of collision, which was to take a, was, was to have a part in our work for, for long, forever after. And then there were those people who didn't, who didn't quite know where to sit. They didn't want to stare at the patients. They didn't want to go out of sight. They didn't want to get into their laps. And the greatest of these was Sullivan, Harry Stack Sullivan. And he thought maybe the right place to sit is beside the patient. Be on the patient's side. And why would he want that? Because he was a social psychiatry. He was developing a social psychiatry. So he wanted to be able to look out with the patient at the world, which the two of them might decide had made a lot of the trouble. Right? So they could look at the world together. So here was another place to sit. Now, each of these people talk differently. Freud did another astonishing thing, didn't he? He suggested that doctors not talk at all. <laughs> or only, or only, as I was, when I was going through the Analytic Institute, we were told we only talk to address negative transmit. Now, all that's been modified in many ways, but that was one of the suggestions that we didn't, we don't, so we don't talk so much, don't get in the way, necessarily. They all had different ways of talking. ways of sitting, different things they wanted to find, the social world, the unconscious world, the description of syndromes, right? or the felt 
human world or the existential, they all had different things. And they all had different enemies, didn't they? What was the enemy of, of, uh, of descriptive psychiatry, of biological psychiatry? That enemy was disease, disease. What was the enemy in psychoanalysis? The unconscious, the unconscious complexes that couldn't be resolved or dealt with. What was the enemy in social psychiatry? People. <laughs> People. That's been the slowest one to be accepted, that there are actually people that are dangerous. And they talk about Hitler. But when you've been in this business for as long as I have, you know that Hitler is not an isolated phenomenon. <laughs> By no means. And there's probably a little bit of Hitler in all of us, but a lot of Hitler in some other things. So different enemies. Different enemies. Well, I thought to myself, now, this isn't such a tough problem. Isn't there an obvious solution? Well, what did what did Krep, what was Kreplin's genius, I asked myself? His genius was observation. To the eye. What was Freud's genius? The mind. He developed this method of collecting all kinds of material, drawing it into his enormously effective mind, and coming out of it with some kind of formulation or hypothesis. And what was the Sullivan's genius? It was to manage the situation, to make it work, to create an atmosphere between the patient and the therapist where you could be frank and honest. And what was, what was the genius of the existentialist? What was Binswanger's genius, or Minkowski, or some of these Americans like Carl Rogers? What was their genius? I think it was a genius for the heart, for understanding and wanting to be with someone, to share their experience. And so I said the obvious thing, the thing that I'm sure must come into your own mind. Why can't we use our <laughs> eyes, our heads, our hearts, our hands, and maybe other things we don't know yet? Why can't we do that? We do it every day. Well, I'm almost done. The, um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was the thing I'll talk about in the next talk I give you is, is, uh, is about what, what the use of the hand and the heart produce in terms of a basic commodity of successful treatment. But I won't go into that now. And let me just... Uh, let me just close on a different kind of note. Today we're in a descriptive biological period of great power, of great interest, hopefully of, of some promise. Where, do we, where will we go from here? Where will we go? What will, for example, a brain science it becomes clinically more active, as it will, particularly with the neuroimaging things that are happening. What will a brain science, how will that shape practice? Some have, some have said that we are going to disappear into neurology. And that may well take place. Psychiatrists have a gift of disappearing. <coughs> For most of our history, we disappeared into administration. The main thing we did was to run hospitals. That was the main thing that psychiatrists wanted to do and could do. For a long time, we disappeared into psychoanalysis. Now we've been disappearing into medicine. Medicine. I say that because it took me, took me 30 or 40 years to realize why medicine is called medicine. You know why it's called medicine? Because doctors like to give medicines. And today, for the first time, we have a lot of medicines to give. So we hold our heads higher, we feel more effective, we may get more bored, but we're at least active and, and uh, helpful. And so this combination of neurology and, and, and pharmacology, I think, will carry us a long way. But the, the note I want to close on is, is, not, is not that, but a different one. It seems to me, it seems to me, that if what we know now about the brain is true, if the brain is really just like the muscle, right? Just like the muscle. And that nothing 
about the mind, there can be nothing about the mind that doesn't have some kind of brain correlate. If the brain and the mind are, are yeah. one, I don't mean that the mind is all the brain, but that the brain has to respond to mind in its broadest aspects. If that's true, if that's really true, then isn't our future much more interesting than it would be if we just were hand people or brain people or thinking people or feeling people? Wouldn't it mean the brain and the mind were really blight, and we had to deal with both, wouldn't it mean that we would need? We would need our eyes, our hearts, our hands, and our minds as well to do this work. So that maybe that would be an occasion to think that we could return to a, a genuinely pluralistic approach to this, to this extraordinary field. Well, thank you. Just to complete the introduction, <laughs> one thing that I wanted to say is, as Les was mentioning, he will be giving more talks in this series throughout the year. We're really going to highlight this year this idea of pluralistic approach to clinical practice that he's developed and really is able to explain in a way that I think illuminates what we're trying to do better than anything that I'm aware of. But there's another factor that, that I wanted to mention today something that's occurred to us over the past year or so. One of the things that Les represents, obviously, he's the most honored teacher in our department, probably in the medical school. And one of the things that I've discovered is that probably the nicest thing to do in your life is to be able to tell other people how much you appreciate what they've done for you. That's especially true for teachers. This department, ever since it was started in the 1960s, has concentrated its efforts on teaching. That has really been the heart and soul of what has happened here over these 40 years. And one of the things that I hope we can do in the future is to, in a more formal way, express our appreciation to all of our teachers, whether they're our patients or our colleagues or trainees or our formal supervisors. I'm not sure of all the different ways we can do this, but there is one way I think we can do that, that I hope will now become a tradition in the department. Our executive committee has decided that what we'll do is establish an award for faculty members to recognize outstanding teaching. And we've also decided that we would name the award in honor of Leston Havens as the person who really exemplifies the spirit of the department and his importance for teaching. So I ask Susan if you'd come forward, please. We'll have the training council decide this year how we will go about awarding this kind of an award to teachers in the department, but I wanted to announce it today and, and have people begin thinking for this academic year of what can we do to recognize the teachers that we have in our department and to express the appreciation that we will carry with us for the rest of our careers for what they've given us. Les, we've, we've got a small plaque here I'll read it to you if, if you like. Presented in grateful appreciation to Leston Laycock Havens, MD, by his students, past, present, and future, on the establishment of the Leston L. Havens Faculty Award for Excellence in Teaching, September 4, 2002, Department of Psychiatry, Cambridge Health Alliance, Harvard Medical School.
if that doesn't make you nervous, nothing will. <laughs> I, th I think that I think that this is a tradition that I hope will continue. That we do take time personally and formally in public like this to tell people who have been so important in our own careers how much they've meant to us and what they've given us and how we realize the impact they make on, on our lives probably in a way that we don't appreciate at the time. One of the conversations I had first when I got here last summer, Al Margulies and I were talking about the impact that our teachers had made on us that we didn't even realize. But over the course of the next 20 to 30 years, we found ourselves not only saying things that they'd taught us, but remembering what they'd said and actually for the first time, I think, understanding it. And I think that's something that I hope all of you in the training programs here will carry with you and, and look back on this year and, and your time here. There's times when you've been given gifts that are much more valuable even than you realize today. That's certainly, I think, what many of us do as we look back on them. Now, that's a brief interruption. I know many of you may have comments or, or questions for Les, so we'll turn it back over to a question period for him. I wish someone would say something you know, funny. Or, or <laughs> The question is, is there, a, is there a change in the way we think about, feel about mental illness that's culturally broad enough to speak about, generalize about? I really don't know. I, um, I still think that most patients come to us with some measure of dread. Um, one of, the, one of, the, of the causes I've been espousing for a long time is the idea that, that the stigma of mental illness, which is part of what you're speaking about, is our own making, our own making. And the reason and the way we make it is because we have no clear ways of defining and recognizing health. So one of the great benefits of the existential movement has been its tendency to, to focus on health, to, uh, to have a, a positive regard, as, as Carl Rogers would have said. But in, systematically, we have not. Now, this was true of 19th century medicine. This was true of 19th century medicine. In 19th century medicine, most of the time, you could not recognize health. My, my neurology teachers told me that their neurology teachers had told them that in the previous generation, something happened which suddenly changed this. It was also true in cardiology and in, in medicine generally. What changed neurology was the capacity to take a hammer, reflex hammer, go over the body and take a pinprick thing, go over the body and limit disease. Suddenly it was this tract or that tract or this part and the rest of you was all right. <laughs> now I don't know, you don't go to the doctor as much as at my age, I do. And, and when you do, you'll discover what I've discovered, which is that you wait for the good news. You wait for the good news. You have to survive the possibility that bad news is certainly increasingly likely to be announced. But that good news is what you wait on. And even if all you've got left, you know, even when you're dying, apparently your hair goes on growing, and your, your nails keep on growing, and I understand the brain goes on working too with, after you're dead. And uh, in fact, that's one of the reasons there's such a big argument about what is death. And, uh, but that's the kind of thing we never hear. You never hear from a psychiatrist, and, uh, or very seldom from a psychiatrist. And so that we add to the stigmatization by not saying to the patient, most of the time, which is what the internist does most of the time, you look pretty good. <laughs> I, have, I have 
have looked at our records longer than most of you, and I have almost never, almost never, seen a good word said about the patient. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. I'm not exaggerating. And until we recognize health, now we don't have any tests like that. I've suggested some of them. Some of you have seen some of the things I've written about soundings as ways of trying to limit off some aspects of health. But before those neurological or cardiological percussion tests, how big is the heart? Where is the level of the fluid? All of which says health when it isn't the way it, sh it should be. But until you do that, until you have a way of looking at the person and saying, well, you look pretty good. You know? And then the person can accept it. Maybe they even have cancer. They can at least fight it with the rest of them. We don't do that. We almost never do that. Or we go over the other side, which is the existential sin of making everything help. Or denying mental illness at all. We're always swinging back and forth between those extremes. But one of the things, so my answer to you is I don't think we've made much progress. And we're not going to. And we have a phenomenon still present in psychiatry, which was very characteristic of 19th century medicine. A new diagnostic system would come on, like the one that came out of St. Louis. Look at the first edition of Goodman and Gose's sex. There were six diseases. Maybe there were eight, but I think there were just six. How many diseases are there now? It's approaching 400. But that's the way it always was in 19th century medicine. A system would begin, it would, where everybody would be sick. Wonderful for business. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously, it's crazy. And, um, and we haven't gotten there yet. So I don't think we've taken the major step we need to, uh, to get rid of that. I have two questions, and one of them is, the, the, in some ways, the central dogma of neuroscience is what you've talked about, that nothing happens in the mind that isn't somehow reflected in the brain. And, and my question is sort of, over the time that you've been observing, how widely has that been accepted? Is that always universally accepted in psychiatry? Uh, have you, or have you seen a change in that? The second question is, is uh, more personal or maybe more a little more depressing, but as you anticipate the changes in psychiatry, uh, I'm sure that you frequently had the experience of, of young people coming to you and saying, should I, should I go to graduate school in psychology or should I go to medical school and become a psychiatrist? And, and I'm wondering what you would say to such a person today and how that's changed over the years. Those are in school, too. <laughs> well, the first question is about, is um, how, would, how would you put that exactly in terms of what? Ask it, ask it in a different way, because it's in two, it seems like it's two questions at first. How widely accepted has this idea been that, that nothing happens I don't, I don't know, and, and um, um, it, I would say probably not very much, but one of the reasons I was, was pausing is that within neurology itself, within neuroscience itself, it hasn't been accepted. For example, our, our sister institution in New Haven, its princi principal neuroscientist is the person who fought this every inch of the way, and is still fighting it, apparently, to some extent, and is still presenting evidence that it's not true. So I don't know how far into neurons that is. Now I think the people I read and what I suspect makes it makes it seem perfectly obvious to me that what's happening is is what always happens is the only way that science really the belief the only reason belief advances when the last generation dies. <laughs> that people go on fighting for their turf till the end. And I think that's part of it. I think the the uh, the uh, bulk of, of the evidence is now uh, and, and, uh, is now in on that. The question is to what kind of education we should have. <laughs> well, 
What kind of education should we have? Psychologists learn more about thinking and feeling than we do in medicine. They're much better readers and, and students of the work than we are. Social work is a different different kettle of fish because it's a social work has all has tended to reflect whatever is the dominant thing in medicine. Uh, my early teachers in psychiatry boasted to me about how they had changed the curriculum at Simmons or, or BU or, or Smith. They had really introduced one of the highest standards, really introduced psychoanalysis. And so that so that social work, which was originally you know, a matter of understanding society and the social <coughs> sources of human problems, you would have thought that would have stayed with, uh, with um, the field. Uh, I mentioned Adolf Meyer. His wife was one of the first social workers. My Harry Caesar Solomon, I mentioned, his wife was a professor of, of uh, social work at Simmons, I think, for many years. And that was a tradition. But again, I think the problem in social work education is the problem of sexism, in my opinion. That is, the, the capacity of women to select what they think is important and make that the subject of the field, which is dominated by women social workers. That hasn't yet been possible in social work. So I don't think we know. Now, that may be too controversial of me to say, but one of the, one of the Great pieces of good news in psychiatry, in my opinion, is that now our classes are at least 50% women. Now, the reason that's good news is twofold, in my opinion. One is that women know more intuitively about psychology than men do, that they're ahead of us. They know, they have a better intuitive sense. Is that because they're a persecuted majority, a persecuted majority, and therefore they have to figure out what's really going on? <laughs> Is that the source of that knowledge? I don't know what it is. Or is it based upon some brain feature or estrogen level or something? I don't know. But that, that's good news for us. And the bad news for us in that, in that is that, um, and this, I, I, I was, uh, as Jay mentioned, I was responsible for a residency program for about 10 years. And the biggest, and I, and I say this passionately now, and I'm glad I have a chance to, the biggest failing you know, of my work and the thing that made me most disappointed in myself <coughs> in the program was that was the difference between the self-evaluations of men and women. We, we had <coughs> lots of wonderful men, certainly, and we had lots of wonderful women. But the men, every good-hearted American man knows he can be president. <laughs> knows he can be president, and, and, and even if he can't get couldn't get his grandmother across the street, he probably will be president. <laughs> <laughs> That's too bitter a statement. Anyway, but women, women, I've seen women who I, I genuinely believe have genius in them, of a very high order, that don't believe it. Don't believe it. And maybe one other part of the program of, of this department could be that, that women could see their genius celebrated, and it could be uh, used especially in a field like psychiatry, which needs it desperately, so, and with good results. Is that any kind